Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life. Come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all sin, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dr. Howell, uh, it's good to have you back with us tonight, and uh, welcome back to the Institute of Catholic Culture. Thank you, Father. It's wonderful to be back. I'm uh, so excited, but I'm going to begin this uh, session this evening with a little bit of a deficit because uh, you've made me envious that I don't live in Northern Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wish I could be with you there uh, during this uh, wonderful Lent season. Uh, thank you all. I recognize some of you from last week, I think. And, uh, and I know there's many more people watching. And so welcome to all of you. I want to again thank Father Hezekiah for his uh, graciousness and willingness and vision for uh, beginning, first of all, beginning the Institute and for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, I was actually, I think in my life, it's a, a bit of an answer to prayer that I could be a part of this because I've been asking God, in what way can I serve beyond my local community? So I'm very thankful for that. Also, thank you to the very competent ICC staff and to all of you participants for being with us this evening. Um, Last week, you asked great questions, and so uh, keep those questions coming. I don't know I could give you equally good answers, but I will try as best I can. I presume then that you have in front of you this evening session two, which is entitled uh, Deserts, uh, Demons, and Daily Life, Confronting our, our Inner Demons. And so what I'd like to do first of all tonight then <clears throat> is to review very quickly some of the highlights that we talked about last week. I tried to share with you last week that from Matthew chapter 4, we learned that our Lord Jesus Christ himself is the original desert father. He goes out into the desert to do, um, to do battle with the devil in our behalf. And I think we need to see two things there that's characteristic of our Lord's life. When he was here upon the earth, our Lord did battle for us just as he redeemed us from our own sin. But he also left us an example of how we enter into his life and how we enter into his mission. The mission that God gives each one of us is really a part of his overall mission. And as I was telling some of my students today, we cannot see what the outcome of that mission is. It's like, it's like putting your money in the stock market. You, do, you make your best judgment, but you never know exactly what's going to happen. You're taking a gamble. But life is like that. It's, and that re requires trust uh, from us. The second thing that I tried to bring out to you last week was how important the teaching of the Desert Fathers is because they challenge our assumption that the way to make society better is by rearranging the uh, men on the chessboard. And that's the way they do it in politics. That's the way they do it in education. Uh, that's the way they do it in corporations, in virtually every walk of life. But the little slogan that I would share with you, and I hope that you'll remember this week too, is that the way that society is going to be changed is not by legislation, but by excavation. That is by digging deep into our own souls and ourselves becoming saints in the making. And in doing so, if everyone were to do that, our society would become very saintly. It would become very holy. Then the last thing that I wanted them to, to uh, challenge you with last week was that the Desert Fathers themselves challenge us 
to do perhaps what takes the greatest courage of all in our lives, and that is to enter into our own interior life and to do battle with the devil and his armies from the inside out. I want to pick up on that by looking at basically 10, seven mainly, but, but 10 different teachings that I've discovered in the Desert Fathers and uh, share them with you as you take up that battle in your own uh, spiritual life. The first three of these really come under the rubric of prerequisites to spiritual growth. Just like there are things in our natural human development and the maturation process of our lives, things that have to take place in us uh, before we can take the next step of life. So there are the same sorts of prerequisites or preparations for spiritual growth in our lives. And the one that overriding, uh, one of the overriding emphases of the church fathers is that we need silence in our lives. Perhaps that not much needs to be said about that, except I found this beautiful quotation, which if you have the outline in front of you, you can read with me, from Thomas Merton, who himself, of course, was a uh, Cistercian or Trappist monk down in Kentucky. He says this, not all men are called to be hermits, but all men need enough silence and solitude in their lives to enable the deep inner voice of their own true self to be heard at least occasionally. When that inner voice is not heard, when man cannot attain to the spiritual peace that comes from being perfectly at one with his true self, his life is always miserable and exhausting. He cannot go on happily for long unless he is in contact with the springs of spiritual life which are hidden in the depths of his own soul. If man is constantly exiled from his own home, locked out from his own spiritual solitude, he ceases to be a true person. He no longer lives as a man. Well, that was in the day before we neutralized a gender in the language, but you get the point, man as mankind. Now, there's two things that strike me about that, and they both remind me of famous sayings one from a saint and one from a, a famous American author. The one from the American author is Henry David Thoreau. I think it was Thoreau who said that most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And the reason, though, that I, I, I've understood that or I've, I've known that quotation from the time I was a teenager, but I've only recently actually understood, I think, why Thoreau thought that people live lives of quiet desperation. And that is because in American culture, going way back into the 19th century, and in fact, back to the Garden of Eden, people cannot tolerate silence. They cannot tolerate silence because it causes them to have to face themselves. And this is extremely difficult. It's difficult for all of us. But especially some try to keep the questions of life at bay so that they don't have to face those things. Now, again, we all develop as we grow up in our adolescent years and early adult years, we develop strategies for keeping things at bay and not having to deal with them. In fact, psychological counselors or professional counselors tell me that often when people uh, experience trauma in their childhood or in their teenage years, sometimes inflicted by others, sometimes self-inflicted, when they experience trauma, it often takes into their 20s before they're mature enough to be able to, to face these things in, in their lives. And that process, uh, these great desert fathers would remind us, is a lifelong process. The second thing that complements uh, Merton's quotation here is the famous uh, statement of St. Augustine in the Confessions, uh, chapter, oh, it's in book seven, uh, chapter 10, in which he says that his, the beginning of his conversion was when he began to go into his own self and he saw that light that was inside of him that was higher than any other light that he'd ever known. Not like a physical light. It was much higher than, than water that floats on oil or oil on water. It was a light that was a light of God. 
And he began to see this because he was reading the Platonic philosophers, probably Plotinus, and uh, he began to realize that this light was so much more desirable than all of the things that he'd filled his life with, whether intellectual accomplishments or sins of the flesh, and that these things had not satisfied him. Well, what he began to realize was that he needed a degree of silence within his life. And he, when he left Europe, when he left Rome to go back to uh, Africa, to his hometown, he wanted to establish a monastery. He wanted to establish something out in the desert. And he wanted to follow the example of the Desert Fathers. But uh, God had a different purpose for him. And that was the purpose, of course, of him being a great teacher and leader. And so what do we have today? Well, he matches St. John Chrysostom in the East in that St. Augustine has left us over 5 million words of his writings, the largest corpus besides St. John Chrysostom and St. Jerome of any church father. And we today have benefited from that greatly. So the first thing that we need in our lives is a degree of silence. And it seems that the older that we grow in our lives, the more we see the wisdom of that, that silence. So in each one of our lives, if we're going to grow in grace, and if we're going to do battle with the devil, we have to have silence within our lives. The second thing that's listed there is stability of place, time, and spirit. Because the lack of stability within our lives will wreak havoc on our spiritual lives. There's a story in the sayings of the Desert Fathers. It's uh, in the edition that I have, which is this one I mentioned last week by translated by Helen Waddell. There's a story in here that talks about the need for uh, stability. It goes like this. A certain brother, while he was in the community, was restless and frequently moved to wrath. And he said with himself, I shall go out and live in some place in solitude where I have no one to speak to or to hear. And I shall be at peace. And this passion of anger shall be still. I'll come back to this quotation later. He went forth and lived by himself in a cave. One day he filled a jug for himself with water and set it on the ground. But it happened that it suddenly overturned. And then he filled it a second time, and again it overturned. And he filled it a third time, and again it overturned. And in a rage, he picked up the jar and he broke it against the rock. And when he'd come to himself, he thought how he had been tricked by the spirit of anger and said, Behold, here I am alone, and no one is with me to, to vex me, and yet anger has conquered me. Because he didn't realize that anger hasn't taken place by surrounding yourself just with silence. He needed to have stability in his inner life. There's another quotation very close to that, and it goes like, it's very short. It says, even as a tree cannot bear fruit of itself when it's often transplanted from one place to another, nor can a monk if he removes himself from one place to another. In other words, if we are restless on the inside, we shall find it difficult to nurture the interior life. Because we are psychophysical beings, we also need stability of place in our outward life. And so when St. Benedict in the early 6th century He's, you know, the father of Western monasticism. When he established these monasteries in, in Italy, he took the three traditional evangelical vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. But to that, he added a fourth one, and that was the vow of stability. Because what these men would do, they would want to be monks, but they wanted to find the perfect monastery where they'd have, they'd have no trouble, no problems anymore. They wanted silence but they wanted it on their own terms. And what they didn't realize was that by going from one monastery to another, they were uh, engendering instability within their lives. So there needs to be a stability of place and time and spirit, whatever that may be for you. For me, it's, there's two places that come immediately to mind. One is I have a sunroom in the back of my home. So especially, and there's, it's all windows, three on three sides, and so in the morning, especially in the, in the spring and in the summer when the sun comes up early, I can go out there and I can be alone. And my dear wife, 
she knows that I'm have definitely hermetic tendencies. So she lets me be alone in the morning and I sit out there and I read my Bible and I read my spiritual books and I, and I pray. Well, the second one is, uh, I don't get, often get as much as I'd like. I don't get to go to our adoration chapel. Our local parish has an adoration chapel that is 24 seven adoration. And I, do, I don't get to go there enough, but when I do go there, I often find myself in the mindset of, Lord, this, it's good to be here because this is my true home. To be here with you, to meditate, to think upon your goodness, to thank you for all your benefits in my life. So find that stability in your own life. If it's not there already, a place of time and especially stability of spirit. The third prerequisite for spiritual growth, uh, oddly enough, is one that I was surprised at, but is definitely in the Desert Fathers, and that is the need for physical labor. And what they actually say is that it is essential to a prayer life to also engage in physical labor. Now, why would that be the case? Because, again, as psychophysical beings, we learn through our bodies. And just as our, we learned, unfortunately, sometimes that the oven is hot. We learned that our mother was right. Don't touch the oven because you're going to get burned. We often learn through the sins of our body that it damages our soul as well. And this is when I was teaching college a few years ago. One of the things I realized was that students in college, because they have that first experience of freedom away from home, they often fall into sins of the flesh, which they don't realize is damaging the inside. It's damaging their soul. Because when we substitute physical pleasure for the deep lasting peace and pleasure of God, we often find ourselves substituting those things which are not going to give us lasting peace. So we're very physical beings, and that being the case, we need to have physical labor. And this is emphasized in several different uh, writings of the church fathers or of the, uh, the desert fathers. And they actually talk about it in terms of the value of physical labor for purgation and holiness. Those lingering tendencies which we have in our lives need to be purged out of our lives. And those things can be done by physical labor. Just as an athlete works so hard to train his or her body to discipline itself, to work toward the goal, we need to be athletes as well, athletes of the spirit. Now, this is emphasized in a number of different places, but one of them is in a great desert father, who actually went to the West. He came to France, to Marseille. Marseille is down uh, near the Mediterranean Sea. And Marseille is a place where he established two monasteries, one for men, one for women. His name is St. John Cassian. So if you've never read St. John Cassian, I strongly recommend it. And he is excerpted and has been translated in several places. But one is in this famous collection, which I hope you all have, called the Philokalia. The Philokalia is a series of writings that were done by Orthodox monks in, I think, the 18th century. But all of the writings in the Philokalia are from the early church. They're from Evagrius, one of the great desert fathers of the fourth century, uh, other St. Mark the Ascetic, and several other very famous uh, spiritual writers of the Greek world in the ancient church. And also St. John Cassian is translated in this volume, and that is the Classics of Western Spirituality series. You probably know that series. And it's got, you know, a, I don't know how many, probably a hundred or more writings of great spiritual writers of the past. And St. John Cassian is in this series as well. His conferences, there's two major writings of his that we have. The first one in Latin is Colaciones, and the other one is the Institutes, and both of those are excerpted. This is not the full thing. They're excerpted in there. I discovered they're not the full thing because 
I'm doing translations of documents on the Eucharist, and he talks about the Eucharist, but in none of these does he talk about those in the ones that, that I've mentioned. But those two very beautiful resources for you. St. John Cassian says about physical labor, when the monk's cave, he's talking about this monk that had been there for many years, when the monk's cave was filled with the work of a whole year, he would set it to fire and burn each year the work of the whole year that he had so carefully accomplished. Thereby, he would prove that without working with his hands, a monk cannot endure to abide in his place, nor can he climb any higher the summit of holiness. Though the necessity of making a living in no way demands this work, let it be done for the soul purging of the heart, the steadying of thought, perseverance in the cell that is in his hut, and the conquest and final throw, overthrow of Acadia or Acadia itself. We'll talk about Acadia or Acadia, and just I'll call it Acadia because that's the way it's pronounced in Greek. But this, this is one of the worst demons of all that afflicts us as human beings. But do you see what he's saying? Even the monk who went out into the desert, they devoted most of their life to prayer. But because they were still men and not angels, they needed to work. Not just to provide for themselves, but there's something good about physical work. Now, if there's anybody that loathes physical work, you're looking at him, all right? Now, now and, and that's why I became a professor, because I was an avid athlete when I was in college, and I neglected the mind. And in college, I mean, when I was in high school, and then when I was in college, I turned all my attention to my mind and neglected physical work. Well, it just so happens that now my, my son and I are working on a project together, which demands that I do physical work. And having read these Desert Fathers about the, the value of physical work, I realize, hey, this is a really good for my spirit to be able to do this. So when you have to clean house and mow your lawn and all of those necessities of life, Think of it as a way of purging your own heart. So these three prerequisites are extremely important to us. One, we do need silence in our lives. Two, we need stability of place. And three, we need physical labor. And that leads us then to consideration of four of the most common demons in our life that um, the, the Desert Fathers talk about. Now, when I say demons, do I mean that literally or metaphorically? Well, for sure I mean it metaphorically. These are the vices that trouble us as human beings, but also maybe even the devil assigns certain things to certain demons and says, hey, you go after that guy because he's got a problem with anger, or you go after that other that person because he, she's got a problem with vainglory, right? And we'll talk about each one of these for just a moment. The problem of anger is a problem that we all know. Some of us know all too well. As I think I hinted last week, when I did my investigation into my uh, heritage, I found out that I was totally and completely Celtic. Right? So I'm, I'm Irish, I'm Welsh, and I'm Scott. And there's one thing you can say about the Celtic peoples is they were warlike. So anger is not very far from my personality. And when I was a little boy, I had a very bad temper. But God, in his love and in his mercy, is able to come overcome even our greatest weaknesses. Well, the Desert Fathers talk about this. And again, this is on pages 94 and 95 of this problem of anger. Well, let's go back to that quotation we had before where the young man, the young monk was, I presume he was young, he was breaking the jar because he got so frustrated because he didn't want, he couldn't get what he wanted. Now think about that for just a moment. One of the roots of anger in our lives is when the world doesn't go the way that we want it to go, the way that we think it should go. And that can be against situations, it can be against people who don't behave like we are. In the last couple of years, 
I found myself in a place I never in my life thought I would be. There's a Catholic high school that's been here about, oh, 18 years now in my hometown. When it first began, I was teaching at the university, and the priest that was the chaplain there asked me, Dr. Howell, would you like to come and teach a Greek, Latin, and Hebrew at the high school? And I said, well, I love teaching Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, but you want me to teach high school? I mean, I thought never in my life would I teach high school, right? Well, one thing led to another, and in the last year, and two years, I've been teaching high school. Now, that's a challenge, I can tell you, right? <laughs> because their maturity level is so much lower than it is for college students, at least the college students that I taught. I don't know about all college students, but the ones that I taught were relatively mature compared. But I love these kids. I really want to do as much as I can. And they come from good families, and they have the best of intentions. But boy, can they try your patience at times, all right? So I figured that God wanted me to do this because he knew that I still had some problems to work on. So this has been a great occasion for spiritual growth for me. Not because I'm accomplishing anything great, but simply because I need God to be able to face those kids every day. And I really enjoy doing that. I love teaching them. I love seeing their the smiles or the the uh, that enlightened look on their face when they finally began to realize. Like today, I was talking to them about the beauty of the liturgy and how it unites heaven and earth. And you could see some of them were like, oh, wow. I thought we were just going to Mass to check off the Catholic box to say, oh, I went to Mass. No, no, no. We're not going to Mass just to check off the box. We're going to Mass to meet God in a very special and unique way, a privileged way. Well, anyway, my point is this. Love in my life Love for them has helped me overcome sometimes the natural impatience that I would have with their, you know, adolescent behavior. Now, let's go back to that monk for just a moment. He broke the jar, and then he says, Behold, here I am alone, and nevertheless, anger has conquered me. I shall return to the community, for in all places there is a need for struggle and for patience, and above all, for the help of God. As Father was emphasizing before we actually began our session this evening, we cannot live the Christian life without the help of God. Remember John chapter 15, where Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. In the middle of that, he says, you, go, you can only bear fruit if you abide in me. And so he says, without me, you can do nothing. And I think we can take them very literally there. Without Jesus, we can do absolutely nothing. The importance of anger and facing anger is emphasized in another short quotation from the abbot Amonas, who is quoted in the sayings of the fathers. It says, the abbot Amonas said that he had spent 14 years in Skedi. Skedi was one of the big centers of the monks. In Skedi, entreating the Lord day and night that he would give him power to master anger. We need to ask God to help us. If we have a problem with anger, we need to ask God to help us. I think one of the keys is what I mentioned here as number two under A, and that is that compassion is more important than strictness. Now, I've had to relearn strictness again in dealing with you know, setting the rules for the teenagers and making them stay by those rules. But often I find myself also having to turn and to realize, no, they need compassion too. James 2.13 says that mercy triumphs over judgment. And so we need, by showing mercy to others, it seems to ameliorate or to soften our hearts toward other people. St. Paul in Romans 12, we won't read the text, but I encourage you to read Romans chapter 14, where he talks about not taking revenge upon others. In other words, instead of uh, exacting evil for evil, do good instead of evil, even to your enemies. And in that way, we are begin that anger within us can begin to subside. Now, 
I don't know, maybe there's some that have become saints on earth before they left the earth. But most of us who have ever struggled with anger are going to face it till the end of our lives. But it can get better. And it can be it can be lessened, and we can be more peaceful in our in and of ourselves. I remember a priest friend of mine, and he he had a problem with anger, and he recognized it. And so he was such a good man, and he was so good that he didn't mind me going to him and saying, "Father, you know you shouldn't have behaved that way," you know. And he would go to me and he'd say, "Ken, you shouldn't have behaved that way in that situation." And one time, <clears throat> and I said, "You know, Father." I really hope that you'll, you know, address this problem of anger that you have, you know. And he said, you know, I've already begun to do that with my spiritual director. And he said, but it's like a J curve, you know, like a J. So a J uh, goes, you know, like, like this, right? If you're going down to the bottom, a J curve means that you are almost to the bottom, but you're not quite, you still got it there, right? And you get to the bottom and the anger has subsided, and then you mean need to make, the, the the journey back up to goodness well if if any of you or myself we continue to deal with the problem of anger that is something that stands in the way of our communion with god so holding grudges uh, revenge the feeling of getting back at people because they've hurt us this can block our communion with god the second vice so common to humanity is lust and desire, spe sexual desire. St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguori says that, and this was in the 18th century, mind you, when we didn't have all the sexual temptations, you know, were so flaunted in front of our face as we have today. He said that most people stumble on the path to holiness uh, because of the sexual sins, because of, of lust. Let's be very clear what we mean by this. Attraction to members of the opposite sex is perfectly natural and good. When we see a beautiful person, a person that we think is beautiful, we can admire that person. It might be their looks, it might be their personality, it might be their knowledge or whatever it is that we admire about that person, but we're attracted to that person. And there's, there's, that's absolutely natural and good. And especially when we're young, and we need to pray for our young people that they will learn this distinction between the natural attraction to others and it turning into a selfish lust and desire. There can be many reasons why people, especially young people, fall into these traps. One of them is illustrated, I think I mentioned last week, the story of St. Mary the Harlot. And that's in this collection by Helen Waddell that I've mentioned. The story is very simple in a way. It goes like this. Abraham was a, was, a, was a desert monk. His brother had died and left an orphan, a seven-year-old girl. There was no one to do. They didn't, they didn't know what to do with her. Now, she, or rather he, as the brother, had inherited a great amount of wealth. But he wanted to be a monk. He wanted to live in his cell. So he made a cell right next to his that had a little window in it, and his niece would live in the other cell. And she grew up as a girl, learning the psalms and the hymns and the disciplines of the spiritual life. Well, sometimes when Abraham had to be out of his cell, maybe in town or walking in the desert or something, there was this other younger monk who, as Mary, became a young woman, he began to lust after her. And so uh, he would go to her door and he would knock at the door and he would say, Mary, Mary, let me come in and have a conversation with you. And he would say, oh, you're such a beautiful, wonderful young lady. And she was finally seduced by his sweet talk. And she gave into his advances and they had sexual uh, contact together. Well, she was devastated by this, and she thought all was lost. And by the way, if you've talked with people very much who've fallen into sexual sins in a you know, major way, you'll discover that, in fact, this is one of the things they do. They, they sort of give up. And maybe they have a good heart. They want to be pure, 
but they give in to the natural desires and then they say, well, what's the, what's the use anymore of trying? And so she was so ashamed. So she had shame, she had regret, and she had self-loathing. And so she couldn't face her uncle. And so one time when he was out, she left and she went into some city. And it doesn't really say what it was. And there, the only way she could make a living was to go into the brothel. And so she became a prostitute. That story has been told over and over and over again in human history. In any case, as the story proceeds, Abraham finds out where she is, and he dresses up like a soldier. And he goes to the city, and he goes to the brothel. And they're sitting around, and this man who's never, who's never drunk a, you know, a glass of wine in years, he starts imbibing the wine. He's acting like he's just a, maybe a, a potential customer of the women that are there. But his niece, Mary, doesn't recognize him. He's got this hat on, he's got his stuff on, and she doesn't recognize who he is. Uh, Maybe he changed his voice or whatever it may be, but she didn't recognize him. And then finally, she says to him, well, let's go up into my room. And so they go up there and it says, the text says, well, this man who had slept on the ground for years and years now now is sitting on a comfortable bed. And so she begins to kiss him as if to persuade him to, you know, pay her to uh, show she can perform her services, right? And he takes off the hat and he says, my dear Mary, do you not recognize me? Do you not see that I'm your uncle Abraham? And And so she begins to weep because of her sins. And so she says, oh, it it all is lost, and uh, I didn't know what to do, and so forth and so on. And he tries to comfort her, and he says, it is no new thing to fall into the mire. It is an evil thing to lie there fallen. Bravely return to that place from which you came. The enemy mocked you in falling, but he shall know you stronger in your rising. In other words, his dear little Mary, his niece, was not beyond hope, nor is anyone else ever beyond hope. With regard to sexual sins, sexual sins, uh, the great, uh, really wonderful confessors that I know have told me that usually these are sins of weakness, not malice. A sin of malice would be something like a person who writes a virus, a computer virus, and is going to destroy people's property with it, or is going to actively go around telling lies about another person who's consciously trying to hurt other people, that's malice. Usually sexual sins are sins of weakness. People simply are drawn into these things, sometimes even against their better judgment. So remember what Abraham says, it's no new thing to fall into the mire but it's an evil thing to lie there fallen. Get up, return to the place from which you've come. The enemy mocks you in falling, but he will know you stronger in your rising. That reminds me of a famous quote from the 13th century Rhineland mystic, Henry Souza, Souza, which is sometimes Latinized as Suzo. Right? This was one of the three great Rhineland mystics, the Dominicans. There was Meister Eckhart, there was Henry Soiza, in German it's pronounced, and then um, then the third one suddenly (laughs) escapes me. I can't remember who it was now. But in any case, these famous medieval mystics of the Rhineland area in Germany, in West Germany, they have many, many spiritual insights. And one of the famous quotes from Henry Suzo is, deepest failure is the fertile seed of highest resurrection. Deepest failure is the fertile seed of highest resurrection. And that's a reminder that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, said to the thief on the cross, you 
today you'll be with me in paradise. Imagine that. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this man was purged of his sins and of his faults. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And by the way, just to finish the story, Mary did come back and she did resume her life of holiness with her uncle Abraham. Just as the, the repentant thief found joy in the paradise of God. No sin is beyond forgiveness if properly repented of. But actually, sexual sins are probably not the most, to most difficult to eradicate. The third one there, as you see on your outline, is vainglory. You know, I always didn't know, I never knew what vainglory actually meant until I read it in Greek. The, trans, the Greek word behind vainglory and the Latin word vangloriosus is, is, goes back to the Greek kenodoxia. I think I've written it there on your outline. Kenodoxia, kenos means empty, vain. Doxia means glory. So vain glory is putting our pride in anything that is less than God himself. In his letter to Heliodorus that I mentioned last week, Jerome, St. Jerome's letter to Heliodorus, he says to him, because Heliodorus has now become a bishop, and he says to him, it is not ecclesiastical rank that makes a man a Christian. What is it that makes us holy? It's not our position, but it's the state of our heart and our mind. Let's think of it under three different uh, aspects or standpoints. One is the pride in one's appearance. That appearance. This, of course, is very, very common within all of us, right? And here's an example. Now, I grew up in Florida. I'm a native Floridian, and you know, I never saw snow before I was 18 years old, age of age. Right? And I've lived up north most of my life now, my adult life, so I've borne the cold. Well, one time a priest in our diocese also, he originally came from Southern California. So since we both grew up in a real warm area, I said, you know, I've been to Southern California, oh, I don't know, a dozen times to give speeches and other things. And I said, Father, tell me, what do you, what's the culture of Southern California really like? And he says, well, at the end of the day, it's how you look. Right? Well, that's the culture of Hollywood. And in warmer climates like Florida and other places, I think people worry more about how they look than people that are just trying to keep warm in the middle of winter. Right? So that's why I've actually liked living up north, because I haven't been quite as tempted to, uh, to vanity, vanity in the modern sense of the word. Pride in one's appearance, but it doesn't have to be one's appearance of one's net face or one's, one's body. It can be pride in one, how one appearances, that one appears to be rich or competent or something like that. And we all want to be competent within our professions, but our trust should not be in how we appear to others. There's uh, something I learned, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago now. I did a, I did a book about uh, the early modern astronomers, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, um, Galileo Galilei, and so forth. And Tycho Brahe was a Danish nobleman, and he had the first modern observatory on the island of Wien in the Danish Sound. Tycho Brahe had a saying in his family crest, and it was, Non videre sed esse, non videre, not to appear, said, but to be esse. In other words, I shouldn't just be worried about how I appear to others. I should be concerned about the kind of man that I really am. The second thing is pride in one's accomplishments, right? And this is a great temptation for us, right? Especially if we've worked many years and we've accomplished certain things, then we say, oh, I think I can rest on my laurels. But let's take the example of one of the greatest popes of the modern world. I wonder who you would say was one of the greatest popes of the modern world. In my estimation, it was a man that I came within 15 feet of when I was in St. Peter's um, Piazza one day. John Paul II. 
John Paul II said that um, our accomplishments are things of the past. What we should be looking is things in the future. As George Weigel said about John Paul II, he was never looking in the rearview mirror. He was always looking ahead. And those of us that are more mature, perhaps we need to remember that as well, because we're here for the young people. It's they who will carry the banner into the next generation or two. And that's why I love being a teacher, whether it's in college or in high school, it's that they are the future of the church. They're the future of the world. And so whatever age we are, should not just rest content with our past accomplishments. We should be looking forward to the future and the way in which we can be still instruments of God until the very last day of our life. The third thing, we can, however, have vainglory, empty pride in our hope of the future. Now, raise your hand if you're either retired or on the verge of retirement. <laughs> Anybody? All right. You say, have you seen father's going to retire here very soon now? Okay. <laughs> well, he's going to raise those six kids. He's trying to be a priest and do the same thing. Wow. What a task he's got. By the way, don't forget to pray for your priest today, okay? Especially Father Hezekiah. Now, you know, if you're close to retirement or retiring, you know how many solicitations people get about managing your retirement income, right? And people are worried. They say the greatest worry that people have is whether they will outlive the income that they have, right? They say, I don't know, it's, I'm on a conservative estimate, it's like 25% of Americans don't have anything saved for retirement. They're planning to, you know, uh, depend upon Social Security or something. And that's just not enough, right, to live even a reasonably comfortable life. Maybe you have to go out in the desert and become a monk, right, if you have to live on, on Social Security. You see, worry about the future is a way of really, I think, falling into the sin of vainglory or pride. And it's a natural thing. And it's not that we shouldn't use our brain. I mean, I'm doing that right now with my own income and my own resources. And But the goal, at least in my life, as I hope for many of you it is too, I want to leave whatever wealth God has given me, such as it is, to my children and to my grandchildren to help them in every ways, and to be a donor to good, good causes for the faith. Never forget Ecclesiastes, the very beginning. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That Hebrew word, Hevel Havelim, it's translated, and I use that translation that's based on the, the Vulgate Latinate. In other words, emptiness of emptiness. Don't put our hope in empty things. That's a great temptation for all of us. The fourth thing here then is Acadia or Acadia. Acadia is basically this. It's a restlessness. It's a listlessness. It's an inability to focus and to concentrate on what is most important. And boy, this is like an epidemic in our society with Facebook and Snapchat and all the distractions around us. Now, some of us who maybe are older, it doesn't affect as much, but the young people, they're mastered, they're, they're ruled by their phones. And we have to keep that in mind, that this is one of the great threats to our society. Let me read this story very quickly. A brother asked an old man, what shall I do, father? For I do nothing that a monk should, but in a kind of heedlessness, I'm eating and drinking and sleeping and always full of bad thoughts and great perturbation, going from one task to the other and from one thought to the other. He says then, he answers, sit in your cell and do what you can and do not be overly troubled. For the little that you do will be even as Anthony did when he did great things and many things in the desert. For I have this trust in God, that whoever sits in his cell for his name and keeps his conscience shall himself be found in Anthony's place. 
you can see what this young monk was settling for. He had the idea that he goes out into the he goes out in the desert, he's going to be free of all the distractions of his life. But the problem is the distractions inside of us, and we take it with us wherever we go. So unless we're at peace in ourselves, whatever we're doing, we're not going to be able to be at peace with the world. So what is Acadia? It is this inertness. In other words, I'm just, I can't get going. And it's not for physical reasons, it's because I don't know what my life is all about. I have no motivation to do anything. The second thing is, is a listlessness where you can't concentrate on anything. I've begun to realize that in my own life, I'm going to have to make a conscious decision to stop doing certain things that are distracting me. Because if I'm going to accomplish things on this Eucharist project that I want to get accomplished before I die, then I'm going to have to make that a great priority. And by the way, don't be afraid to ask a friend to help you here. I'm working with a young man on the Eucharist right now, a book of readings on the Eucharist for every day of the year. I want to put it in the hands of every priest and every religious first, and then others can use it as well they want. But it, I've never seen a book like this done. But we've translated many of the Church Fathers' statements about the Eucharist, and we're going to publish it, hopefully, this summer. But what I've found in the process of doing that was that I needed the help of my friend to keep me on track because I can get so easily distracted by other things. The third thing that's listed often is an aversion to one's place, all right? And that is, oh, I just got to get out of here. You know, I'm not happy where I am. Happiness doesn't come just by changing place. And then maybe most important, and that is the scorn and contempt for one's brethren. The way it comes up in people's lives is, well, I may not be perfect, but I'm not as bad as he is, right? In other words, I've got a long way to go, but I'm pretty good compared to other people, right? And so we, we lie to ourselves by thinking, this is all what they call the noonday devil. This is the way in which the devil tries to discourage us. He tries to deflate us. He tries to keep us down. And as St. Ignatius of Loyola so beautifully said, discouragement is never from God. It's always from the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, the pathway to sanctity. First of all, remember Romans chapter 6. It's not listed there, but Romans chapter 6 Remember your baptism often. Remember that when you dip your fingers into the holy water and you bless or cross yourself, you're reminding yourself that you are a child of God, that you are called into the battle because of your baptism. You are to relive the life of Christ on the earth. Was he a teacher? Then you need to be a teacher too, in some way, shape, or form. Where he was a healer in some way you can heal, whether it's spiritual or physical or whatever it is, try to be a healer. But the way that we do that is by remembering our status as baptized children of God. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to following, that's where Paul says, do you not know that you are baptized into the death and the resurrection of Christ? The seeds of holiness already reside within our hearts. All we need to do is to access them. The second thing, though, is that we need spiritual exercises. We need to be prepared for the battle. And this is where John Cassian, again, can help us. He says he's talking about people that are struggling. He says, they feel the many-winged folly of their soul, nor can they control its wanton forays. Contrition of spirit comes hard to them. They find the perpetual silence tolerable. And these that no labor on earth could weary are vanquished by idleness and worn out by the long lasting of their peace. That's why we have to go back and ask God for help. And if we do these things, if we engage and persevere in this spiritual warfare, we will gain the spoils of war. What are the spoils of spiritual warfare? You'll truly become a spiritual father and a spiritual mother. We have the official fathers and mothers 
like Father Zacchaeus. We have others who in our lives have been it. But we need to be that too, maybe to our children, to our grandchildren, to these young people that we have contact with. Whatever it is, we can be spiritual guides for them. And by the way, you've probably noticed that there's just not enough priests to go around, right? So we need to too ask God, make me a spiritual father, make me a spiritual mother. And this young man that I mentioned that I'm working with, he is, he's got the gift of spiritual fatherhood. And he's a layman, like I am, but he's got that gift. And the young people just really are drawn to him. And he gives them that spiritual, paternal spirit. Let's finish with this. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, maybe down through 20. Here's what it says. Finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And he says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities and the powers and the spiritual forces of wickedness. That is where our battle really lies. And the weapons that we need, we have this word in English. It comes right out of Greek, the panoply. The panoplium is the full armor of God. I just imagine this Homeric warrior there with all of his armor on. That's the virtues that are developing within us as we face the devices. Two practical suggestions here at the end, then before we stop. One, follow the example of St. John Chrysostom. He went out into the mountains around Antioch, and he memorized extensive passages out of the Bible. When you read his homilies, you'll see that he quotes word for word right out of the text of the Bible. Well, how do I know he's quoting from memory and not reading it? Because sometimes he makes a mistake. And he switches words around that the original Greek text says this way, and he switches it around. One of his most famous errors, which you see it's beautiful to have that error, because it shows he was memorizing. He just got made a mistake, as we all do. One of them is, remember what it says in John chapter 19, that they, the soldier pierced Jesus' side and blood and water flowed out? He says, he always switches it around. He says, water and blood flowed out. And he does it because he's making the connection to baptism. Baptism, the water that flowed out of Jesus' side, flowed into the waters of baptism, and that cleanses us from sin. The blood that flowed into the chalice, and that is the blood of Christ. So memorize scripture. If you spend your time memorizing scripture, you will grow in grace. There's no doubt about it. But then the final thing, and that is, a question that my spiritual director often asks me. I'll tell him about, oh, I'm struggling with this, and I have this problem, I have that problem. And you know what he asked me? A very simple question. Ken, have you prayed about it? And I say, oh, no, I haven't prayed about it. Yes, ask God to help you. He wants you to be holier than you want to be. So ask him for help in this respect. There's a practice in the Eastern Church that I know Father knows very well. But those of you that may be like me are Latin Rite Catholics, maybe you don't know this. You know the Jesus prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. They were, the, the, some of the Eastern monks would pray that all the time, constantly praying, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because it wasn't like a mantra, like a Buddhist mantra. It was a plea to Jesus to hear us because he said, without me, you can do nothing. So let's take him at his word and ask him to help us to grow in holiness. Thank you, Dr. Howell. Excellent, wonderful presentation. And, and um, you know, one of your, well, it wasn't an opening remark, but toward the beginning of your, of your presentation tonight, talking about the importance of, of labor, of work, for the man of prayer and I just thought you know during this Lenten season what a it's kind of eye-opening in the sense it's almost this doorway a necessity but there a necessity which our society has just made almost impossible because the work they're talking of is real physical like you're talking about physical manual labor you have a wonderful program coming up in the next quarter those that are participating tonight get to hear for the first time but we're having an ICC farm day where we're going to go out uh, to a to a local Catholic farm, and and we're going to have an opportunity to to, to talk there 
with the guys that are working the farm and, and so forth to, to maybe learn some, some principles that they're using, but go to back to our homes and even in our small city gardens to kind of become that, that man of work for the sake of the kingdom. And, and I mean, it's jewel, little jewels like that, little re- reminders for us from the Desert Fathers, I think are just so valuable that uh, bring us kind of back home to that home base of, of the spiritual life. So just thank you so much, Dr. Howell. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Father. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.